Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this webinar on COVID-19 vaccines for myeloma patients. Uh, my name is Ana Vallejo. I'm the Myeloma Patient Europe Communications Manager, and I will moderate this webinar today. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, as you know, COVID vaccination has raised a lot of questions, and especially around patients, about what is the, be the best vaccine for patients or how COVID vaccines affect, uh, might affect myeloma and yellow immunosis treatment. Um, MPE has developed a Q&A on COVID vaccination that you can read on our website, and we hope that we can solve um, some of your questions during this webinar. Uh, before we start, uh, just for your information, just uh, mention that this webinar will be fully recorded and will be uploaded to the MPE, uh, to the Myeloma Patient Europe website, which is www.mpeurope.org, uh, and it will be also available in our, in our YouTube channel. And before we start, I would like to make a small summary on the webinar's agenda. Um, the webinar is scheduled, as you know, from five to six. So the presentation will last about uh, 40 or 45 minutes, and then I will open the session for questions. Um, there are two ways in which you can ask questions to the doctor. Uh, one of them is using the microphone in your computer, as I'm doing now. Uh, just press the right hand button that you will see on your screen. I will unmute you, uh, so you can ask the question directly to the doctor. And the other possibility is to do that in writing in the question and answer window. Um, I will receive those questions and I will read them to the doctor uh, so she can answer them. Um, as you know, the talk uh, will be given by Dr. Ana Sureda, Head of Hematology Department at Instituto Catalán de Oncología in Spain. And on behalf of MPE, Dr. Sureda, I would like to thank you for your collaboration, for your time preparing and giving this webinar and um, for summarizing for the patient community the most important updates on the, on the approved COVID vaccines in Europe. So thank you very much for helping us always with this kind of activities and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for this kind introduction. Um, first of all, I would like to thank MPE and especially you for inviting me to participate in this webinar, which I think it's not so easy because unfortunately, when we talk about COVID-19 vaccines in multiple myeloma and of course in other hematological malignancies, probably we have more questions than answers uh, even nowadays. So I'll try to give an overview on COVID-19 infection. And basically I want to highlight some aspects that at the end will lead us to discuss COVID-19 vaccines in patients with multiple myeloma. So let me see if I can share the screen. Sure. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, it's fine now. Perfect. Thanks so much. So that's the title of my presentation. And of course, as Anna has said, we will be able to have some minutes for Q and A's after the presentation. And here you have my disclosures. So here you have the agenda for the presentation. I'm going to introduce you a little bit to uh, the respiratory viruses in hematology and what they represent uh, for us. Of course, I will be discussing then the introduction of SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 infection the clinical impact of this viral infection in hematological malignancies in general, and of course in patients with multiple myeloma. And then I will be going into seroconversion to SARS-CoV-2 infection, and then of course the vaccination plan in oncohematological patients with a specific mention to multiple myeloma. So let's start with respiratory viruses. And here in this, in this slide, I have tried to put, hopefully, a, quite a comprehensive list of the, uh, the different uh, viruses that we can eventually find in our patients. So the first group is basically a DNA virus. And here, I'm sure that you can recognize some of them. Herpes simplex virus belong to this group, varicella zoster, CMV, EBV, EBV, and other um, herpes, herpes virus 6, 7, and 8. And uh, we have to recognize that uh, basically the first infection uh, when we talk about these viruses, uh, it's happening during childhood and in young adults. And usually disease uh, comes because of an endogenous reactivation. And it's very infrequent to have exogenous reinfection. This is completely different 
from the situation that we see when we talk about community respiratory viruses. And here you have uh, flu, metaneumovirus, rhinovirus, enterovirus, coronavirus, and we will be discussing quite a lot about it. And here we never have an endogenous reactivation, and it's usually an exogenous infection. So that's another way of looking at these uh, different types of viruses. And so when we think about community respiratory viruses and we think about the different type of hosts that we can have, so if we look at adult people that are not immunosuppressed, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to say that the period of viral excretion is really quite low. Uh, that the viral load per drop is also quite low, and this is quite different from what we can see here in immunodepressed adults. So basically patients with hematological malignancies and multiple myeloma. Here, the, uh, the patient can be eventually excreting uh, the virus for many days, eventually for several weeks, and the uh, viral load in each drop is quite high. Basically, the infection, um, in many cases, here in the non-immunodepressed uh, adults, uh, is being produced through the hands, although also it's related to the inhalation of respiratory uh, drops. And if we look at children, so children, non-immunosuppressed children, are basically characterized to have multiple and very close contacts. And they also uh, present with a high viral load in each one of the drops. So basically, immunodeficient patients and children are the most infective ones. And in this slide, basically, you can see the number of patients that have positive uh, samples with respect to SARS-CoV-2 uh, since the time of diagnosis. And probably this is being better seen here. Uh, in this graph that basically represents that when we talk about immunocompromised cause, so basically looking at patients with hematological malignancies, the viral load is higher, and basically the peak is a little bit later than the development or the peak of the symptoms. And then this area under the curve, which is basically this area that I am showing here with the pointer, is really very high if we compare it with the immunocompetent adults. And that's one thing that we have to take into consideration. Another important thing to take into consideration, and these graphs have been taken from a paper that was published several years ago by Jose Luis Piñana, who is a hematologist working in one of the hospitals in Valencia. And he was basically looking at the community acquired respiratory virus. So the hospital admission rate, um, which was directly related to respiratory virus, was 22%. And the overall mortality was 18% in the population of hematological patients that he was looking at. So that's another important thing to take into consideration. And I'm not going to go um, through all the different risk factors that immunocompromised hosts have to develop this community respiratory virus infection. But as you can see, um, I mean, there are quite a lot of them that also have an impact uh, in the uh, disease progression to lower respiratory tract infection, basically lymphopenia, old age, smoking, uh, for transplant patients, high dose TPI, uh, TBI, the uh, type of donor, allogeneic stem cell transplantation. And of course, there are other factors that are associated to mortality related by these um, viral infections. And finally, I mean, to end up with this uh, part of the presentation, and as I have basically been mentioning a little bit before, we have to take into consideration that there is a mortality which is related to the development of all these viral infections. As you can see here for coronavirus, for rhinovirus, and metaneumovirus. So that's a kind of a very quick summary of what we were um, 
uh, working with uh, in terms of respiratory virus when talking about patients with hematological malignancies, uh, immunosuppressed patients, but not um, um, very far away ago, we had what I have called here the tsunami COVID-19. So what's SARS-CoV-2? So uh, basically it belongs to the coronavirus family. And coronavirus family, it's a very large family of viruses that can cause illness that has really uh, quite wide range in terms of um, signs and symptoms. And it can go from really a common cold, which does not have any clinical significance, to producing severe disease. It's a beta coronavirus and the natural reservoir are bats and the final hosts are humans and eventually horses. If we look at some biological characteristics of SARS-CoV-2, I want to highlight that this RO index that basically represents the average number of people that can be infected by each sick person is around three, between 2.5 and 3.5. And if we compare it with the seasonal influenza, uh, it's really significantly higher. The transmission is basically through big drops. So this is why we have, let's say, to keep this security di distance. Uh, there has no um, fetal transmission being described. And uh, there, uh, it has also been described some fecal oral transmission. But basically, it's a respiratory transmission. From a clinical point of view, we can separate the infection into three different stages. The first one basically is characterized by some clinical symptoms or signs which are related to the viral response rate. But then we, we continue with the stage two and the stage uh, three, uh, that it's basically the pulmonary phase and the hyperinflammation phase that it's associated to the different uh, clinical characteristics of this type of infection, which is quite different from what we knew from prior uh, respiratory viruses. As you know, uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, basically emerged in Wuhan, uh, which is in the province of Hubei in China, and that was the late December in 2019. And here I have highlighted some numbers that uh, it's very clear on this slide, it's a little bit old, which are completely outdated nowadays. The most important thing is that really very quickly and as uh, in a different way than other viruses that basically appeared here in China, but they remain here in China. Um, COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 basically is spread out throughout the world in this kind of picture that I am presenting here. And unfortunately, this picture probably has bigger red dots than the ones that I am presenting here. If we look, um, just bringing as a matter of example, uh, kind of uh, numbers of patients being diagnosed per day in Spain uh, since, uh, let's say, mid-March, um, and that was basically the official lockdown for the first wave. And unfortunately, although we were quite good in stopping the virus uh, transmission after the first uh, wave with really very strong lockdown measures from July last year, um, basically uh, one wave has been mounting on top of the other one. And we are around what we consider the fourth wave. And of course, these waves have been associated with a significant number of people dying from this viral infection, something that probably none of us would have thought that this was going to happen to us, uh, I mean, before um, December 2019, at least myself. So what's the clinical impact of SARS-CoV-2 in hematological malignancies? 
So um, the epidemiology of this uh, respiratory virus infection in oncohematological patients is some, goes somewhat in parallel to that of the general population. And I'm just going to show you an example of that. But we have to take into consideration that the clinical behavior is completely different in immunosuppressed patients. So the clinical picture is more severe. We have already seen that the viral excretion is much more prolonged in immunosuppressed patients. There is a more frequent transition, and I have already shown you maybe quite too quickly some prognostic factors um, to uh, move from an upper respiratory tract infection to a lower respiratory tract infection. And we have a higher mortality rate in this situation. This is what I was telling you before about this quite similar epidemiology between what has happened in the general population and what has happened in our uh, hematological patients. And this figure here on the right hand side has been taken from one of these official information coming from the Ministry of Health in Spain. So starting here on the 1st in March in 2020, that basically represents the new cases diagnosed by PCR uh, during the first wave. And here you can see which was the number of uh, newly diagnosed COVID-19 infected patients in a retrospective analysis that we did, basically looking at the infection of hematological uh, patients during the first wave. So from the beginning of March to basically the end of May. And uh, that's, let's say, the title of this paper. And here we try to analyze the risk factors and the outcome of COVID-19 infection in patients with hematological malignancies. And we put a special emphasis in looking at those patients that had been transplanted, either autologous or allogeneic stem cell transplantation. And um, um, we identified, first of all, some risk factors for these patients to develop severe pneumonia. The first one was hypertension. That's very important to, uh, to remember because sometimes the risk factors for morbidity and for mortality related to SARS-CoV-2 infection is not exactly related to the underlying disease, but it's related to the comorbidities that the patient in this case has um, in addition to the underlying disease. So uh, I, hypertension was able to increase in this analysis twice um, the incidence of severe pneumonia. Also, we have to take into consideration lymphopenia, and also we have to take into consideration inflammation parameters like CRP. Another important thing is that we were able to identify some risk factors that were associated to mortality related to COVID-19 infection. And I want to highlight age, which maybe it's not a surprise for anybody. Those patients that had active disease at the time of um, infection also had a higher mortality rate. Neutropenia was also an adverse prognostic factor as I have mentioned, for the development of pneumonia, inflammation, and basically we are using CRP as a marker for inflammation. And last but not least, the performance status of the patient that, was, that had also a significant impact in mortality. So another example, because I have to say that initially we didn't, we didn't have any information about it, but um, I mean, the scientific community and all the allied partners were so quick in producing information regarding uh, the impact of this infection in, in this case, hematological malignancies that the literature was completely overloaded with uh, different manuscripts. And here you have another analysis that was published by the Italian group, also looking at the clinical characteristics and risk factors associated to COVID-19 severity in patients with hematological malignancies. And what they found is something quite similar to what we found in our retrospective analysis. So age um, was an important prognostic factor, and there were 
some specific hematological malignancies, acute leukemias, lymphoproliferative disorders, and I would include here plasma cell neoplasm as a lymphoid malignancy had were um, adverse prognostic factors in terms of mortality due to, uh, due to, uh, to this infection. And finally, um, at the end of last year, December 2020, we had the information coming from a systematic review and meta-analysis in more than 3,000 patients that had been included in prior uh, retrospective analysis. And here you have the take-home uh, take messages. So the mortality appears to be high in patients with hematological malignancies and COVID-19 infection. There were some prognostic factors that were quite constant in the different manuscripts, um, in the different analyses uh, that were published. So basically age, um, older patients older than 60 years had a higher uh, mortality related to the infections, also non-white patients uh, having received recent systemic anti-cancer therapy uh, was also um, in some cases associated to um, an impact in the mortality but of course there was also a higher proportion of patients that were able to survive and in, in this slide you can see what I have already said in a kind of a graphical way so adult patients as usually happened do uh, less well than um, uh, children. Uh, here you can see the impact of age, also the not so clear impact of recent anti-cancer treatment, although there are some um, manuscripts or some analyses that indicate that recent treatment has a negative impact in terms of morbidity and mortality and also the impact of um, the race, non-white patients doing worse than white patients. So uh, we have had a look, let's say an overall look at the clinical impact of SARS-CoV-2 in um, patients with hematological malignancies. What about the clinical impact in patients with multiple myeloma? And here, as a matter of example, I'm bringing a paper that the Spanish uh, multiple myeloma group, the Gempetema group, and this paper was co-authored by Joaquin Martinez Lopez and Maribi Mateos. Uh, so we were looking at the clinical characteristics and prognostic factors for those patients with multiple myeloma that were admitted in a big number of Spanish hospitals in hospital because of COVID-19 infection. And we also wanted to compare the um, outcome of these patients with the outcome of a population, of a general population of patients. So patients with non-hematological malignancies that had been admitted at the same time in the same hospitals where these multiple myeloma patients were admitted. And to make this story short, we uh, basically included almost 200 patients reported from 73 uh, hospitals. And just, just to show you that this analysis came from the patients that were admitted during the first wave, so March, March and April in Spain 2020. And this analysis is ongoing. So uh, the, um, I mean, one piece of information which is important is that the inpatient mortality um, was higher in patients with multiple myeloma than in patients with non-cancer, 34% and 23%. Among multiple myeloma patients, the inpatient mortality was 41% in male. It was higher in um, the elderly population of patients, older than 65. It was also higher in patients with active and pro or progressive disease at the time of being admitted. And also um, renal disease was a negative prognostic factor in terms of, um, of mortality and morbidity. And all these factors were independent prognostic factors when we did this uh, multivariate analysis. And here you can see, uh, I mean, the same information I have given you in a graph, in a more graphical way. So age older than 65 was an adverse prognostic factor. The presence of renal, uh, renal disease, 
also patients with active disease or progressive disease at the time of being infected, some, some specific multiple myeloma features at the time of diagnosis and treatment, and um, prior stem cell transplantation did not have an adverse uh, a prognostic impact in this series. So, of course, I mean, just focalizing our attention in patients with multiple myeloma, um, it's clear that um, these uh, patients with multiple myeloma represent um, an, a vulnerable uh, population of patients that was clearly recognized and here, um, as an example of the multiple efforts that have been done um, over the last few months um, to establish an adequate management of patients with multiple myeloma during this COVID-19 pandemic, I'm putting here this consensus paper coming from the European Multiple Myeloma Network with many very famous names that probably you will be able to recognize. Uh, and to finish this part of this uh, of the presentation, just uh, a summary of some mortality rates, looking from different, let's say, countries or eventually areas, uh, looking at different types of hematological malignancies. And we have to recognize that, um, let's say, mortality rates in some cases are above 30% or eventually 40%, and this has to be taken into consideration. So when we try to think, um, uh, because, I mean, we have already seen that for those patients being infected, and basically for those patients that had to be admitted in the hospital, because this is one thing that we are probably analyzing now, and we have not analyzed so much, or we did not analyze so much at the very beginning, because all these studies were basically focused on those patients that had to be admitted because of COVID-19 infection. But of course, we were missing, and this is one thing that it's being analyzed nowadays, we were missing those patients that had COVID-19 infection and did not have to be admitted in the hospital. But for those patients that had to be admitted in the hospital, we have seen um, that the infection is really severe. We have been able to identify some prognostic factors. We know some figures in terms of mortality. But then what happens when patients are being infected with COVID-19? Um, and that's the other thing that what we need to take into consideration because these considerations about seroconversion will take me to discuss with you um, some um, question marks that we still have nowadays regarding the vaccination plan. So what we know about seroconversion, so which is the capacity, and that's very important for patients that are immunosuppressed to mount an immunological response, either um, a humoral response or a cellular response uh, when patients go through a severe COVID-19. So what you can see here um, in this paper that was really very recently published only a few weeks or months ago, already in 2021, is that in general, the capacity of patient with the underlying diagnosis of cancer, um, the, um, the prevalence of IgG after um, having gone through COVID-19 infection is significantly lower than in those patients that went through COVID-19 infection but did not have the underlying diagnosis of cancer. And this is one thing that we have to take into consideration. And I'm bringing here some examples that are basically looking at hemato-oncology patients, um, indicating the somewhat low capacity of hematological patients to mount a humoral and eventual a cellular response to COVID-19 infection. So in this 
study that included uh, a small number of patients um, that um, were infected by SARS-CoV-2. Only two out of 12 patients were able to generate IgG antibodies. So that's an example of the capacity of patients with hematological malignancies to develop IgG antibodies against the infection. And this is one thing that we will have to take into consideration when talking about vaccinations and vaccines in this specific population of patients. And here I have brought some really very quick examples that have been taken from very recent publications that have appeared in the literature. So in this analysis from CLL patients, the percentage of patients that were able to develop IgG antibodies uh, in front of SARS-CoV-2 was 67% uh, in this study looking at the small numbers of transplant and patients and patients being treated with CAR T cells. Um, the percentage was 62% uh, and in AML in this really very small group of patients, 88%. And in this study, which was a prospective study that was published in January this year in the Annals of Oncology, the authors were basically looking at the seroconversion capacity of patients with cancer, basically solid tumors, in relation to uh, healthcare workers in an oncology unit. So, um, in this specific case, um, the data showed that the, um, there was no clear difference between the uh, capacity to detect IgG antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 between cancer patients and healthy, and healthy sub uh, subjects. But this is one thing that we have to take into consideration when um, uh, let's say, looking at the capacity to respond from an immunological point of view uh, to the infection first and potentially to the vaccination later on. So let's go back a little bit, not talk about COVID-19, uh, and just think about vaccination in hematology, uh, which is our pre prior experience. I mean, I'm sure that all of you are aware that uh, many hematological patients have a uh, vaccination calendar and this is one thing that we are doing every single year and that for transplant patients we have a very clear vaccination program to try to give uh, the patients all the immunity that has been lost because of the transplantation procedure. And here I'm bringing this example that it's being discussed almost by everybody right now about the role of rituximab um, to allow an immune response to vaccination in lymphoma. And the summary of this slide is that the use of monoclonal antibodies anti CD20 in this specific case, and here data basically come from the information we have from flu vaccination, is that it's quite difficult to mount an immune response for those patients that are under rituximab treatment or have just finished uh, rituximab therapy. So that's one thing that we need to take into consideration. If we look at patients with chronic lymphocytic uh, leukemia, so it's also uh, quite cl clear, and this information comes from the flu vaccination, is that the response of these patients uh, to this specific vaccine was not uh, so good enough with quite low responses coming from uh, different studies that have already been uh, published. And even this is not only the case with eventually chemotherapy, but also there is a low response rate uh, to flu vaccination in patients that are being treated with ibrutinib that you may know it's a really a quite extended and almost universally used, let's put it this way, um, BTK inhibitors in patients with CLM. And we have identified, and this is not the setting 
still for SARS-CoV-2, but there are some prognostic factors that can eventually impact the immune response of the patient to vaccination. If we talk, for instance, about transplant, the shorter time interval between transplantation and vaccination, low lymphocyte counts, low immunoglobulin levels, the presence of active graft versus host disease, um, the active immunosuppressor therapy, and eventually rituximab therapy over the last 12 months. So that's one thing to be taken into consideration. But of course, it's very clear that what we want to achieve with, with vaccination in general, not only immunosuppressed patients, but also in immunocompetent people is this, what we call the group of immunity to try to stop the um, infectious capacity of the, of the virus as much as possible, as it's more or less depicted in this graph that I am showing here in this slide. So taking all these things into consideration, which has been the vaccination plan in Hong Kong hematological patients, and I'm going, of course, to uh, give a special mention uh, to multiple myeloma patients. So first of all, I think that everybody's aware that the development of vaccines against uh, SARS-CoV-2 has gone through a quite not different, but a more speedy process than the traditional development of vaccines in a situation outside the one that we are living. And here you can see that the normal process, which is presented here in the upper side of the slide, um, with preclinical studies, development of preclinical and toxicity studies, and then clinical trials starting with phase one, phase two, and phase three, and then submitting all this information to the regulatory agencies, FDA, EMA, and then start with the large scale production, which can take quite a long time, several years. It has been really speed up when we talk about SARS-CoV-2 vaccine development, basically because many of these phases have been mounting one on top of each other to try to accelerate as much as possible this process and try to reach this kind of group of immunity that we were discussing before. So these are the vaccines that uh, we have nowadays. So basically, I want to mention these messenger RNA vaccines, so the Pfizer, BioNTech, which was the one, the first one that we had in the market, and then the Moderna vaccine. You know that we have two different shots uh, here and basically separated by uh, three weeks. Then we have the non-replicating vector vaccines that are basically using adenoviruses. And here I want to mention the AstraZeneca vaccine and then the Janssen vaccine that um, basically is the last one that has been approved and it's being distributed by different European countries. And here, the responses to the vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. So with higher rates, uh, with Pfizer and Moderna, and with somewhat lower rates, but of course, uh, we need to understand that the development of the different vaccines is not exactly the same. So maybe with the other types of vaccines. So, I mean, I'm just bringing, and I have to apologize because these slides are in Spanish. Uh, just, I want to give you as a matter of example, how the process of vaccination has happened in Spain. And I imagine that it has been quite similar in different European countries. Of course, always taking into consideration the specific aspects that apply to to the different countries. So here you have, let's say, a kind of advertising that was published in the official web page of the Spanish Society for Hematology and Hemotherapy, basically indicating the pressure that the scientific societies have put in the healthcare system and the Ministry of Health to try uh, taking into consideration 
the high morbidity and mortality that COVID-19 infection has in hematological patients to try to put a pressure to, to try to include this specific group of patients in the vaccination programs that uh, in Spain, and I guess that this has been quite similar in other countries, was basically related to the age of the patient. Uh, there were, and there was a manuscript that was basically collecting all the recommendations coming from the Spanish Society of Hematology of vaccination, COVID-19 vaccination in a hematological patient, and that was really a big document that was under the umbrella of the Spanish society, but had the input and the participation of the different um, uh, working groups. And then we ended up with, um, let's say, a press uh, note that was published on the 11th of March this year, indicating that uh, transplant patients solid organ transplants and oncohematological patients were candidates to be uh, uh, to receive vaccination or to be vaccinated in a priority way when talking about vaccination we have to take into consideration several aspects and um, probably some of the questions that will be coming later on will be touching these different aspects first of all we have to take into consideration that hematological malignancies are diverse and are not exactly the same. We have to take into consideration the absence of scientific evidence regarding the efficacy of vaccine in patients with hematological malignancies, because as you know, these patients were actively excluded from the pivotal prospective clinical trial, as usually happens. And we have some available scientific evidence regarding other vaccines that we have been using for many, many years in this population of patients. So when do we uh, have to vaccinate against COVID-19? Um, and which are the general recommendations? This slide is quite busy. And for the sake of time, um, because we want to focus our attention in multiple myeloma patients, I'm just going to go to this slide that tries to give some um, recommendations on what to do with patients with multiple myeloma and other plasma cell disorders. And taking into consideration, I hope you can see well this slide, that the um, mortality of COVID-19 infection was higher in these patients, in multiple myeloma patients, as we have seen, than in the general population of patients. And the other thing that we have to take into consideration is the poor response that we have seen in several analyses when talking about influenza vaccines. So we have to take into consideration those patients that are severely uh, neutropenic. Um, the recommendation is to vaccinate every single patient, uh, even patients with smoldering multiple myeloma and other less aggressive, let's put it this way, uh, monoclonal gammopathy. Uh, so if the patient has active disease, we try to, uh, our recommendation is to vaccinate the patient uh, without stopping uh, the active treatment, but basically between cycles, some days before the beginning of the uh, next, uh, next cycle. If the patient has the multiple myeloma under control, we can eventually consider to hold the treatment uh, between seven days before and seven days after vaccination. There are some indications to eventually stop glucocorticoids during vaccination and to avoid high dose immunoglobulins at least one month prior to vaccination. But nevertheless, I think that it's very important to take into consideration that we don't have clear evidence in the literature that what we are doing is the 100% correct thing. So we are basically extrapolating some of the recommendations from other settings. And I basically want to finish my presentation with, um, let's say, some information regarding the efficacy of um, COVID-19 vaccine in our patients. So this is one thing that we really don't know. When we talk about vaccination and uh, all the discussions on 
which are the patients that we need to vaccinate, when these patients need to be vaccinated. Uh, the most important thing are not the adverse events that we can um, uh, assume that are associated to vaccinated, vaccination, but basically what we really don't know is uh, the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccine in patients with hematological malignancies. And I have brought here two very quick examples that have with two papers that have just been published. I mean, one of them, it's almost still not in press. I mean, it's in press, but they are really, really very new. This um, paper analyzes the efficacy of Pfizer vaccine in patients with CLL. And I have just highlighted here things that I wanted to mention you. And basically, uh, it, I mean, these 52 patients were compared with 52 sex and age match healthy controls. So we have to take into consideration something that we might eventually um, guess with the information that we already had that the response rate was significantly reduced in CLL patients with respect to healthy control, that the response rate was highest in those patients that achieved the clinical remission after treatment, followed by treatment naive, and it was quite low in those patients that were under treatment at the time of vaccination that also those patients that were treated with DTK inhibitors or venetoclax plus minus anti-CD20 antibodies, the response rate were quite low. So that's one thing to be taken into consideration. And um, um, uh, a similar um, information uh, can be taken from this very recently published paper that was published online only in April 19 that was looking at the response to first vaccination in patients with multiple myeloma. So uh, these are things that we need to take into consideration. And unfortunately, we don't have answers to these questions. So we still need to learn um, which is the best way to vaccinate patients with oncohematological malignancies, because we can eventually assume that the uh, humoral response and the cellular response is not going to be as good as in the healthy population um, of people and that we eventually will need to change the schedule of vaccination uh, just according to the uh, response rate that we get. And here I wanted just to highlight some limitations to vaccination that are related maybe to um, daily uh, problems, how is the vaccine being distributed, centralized versus decentralized uh, administration of vaccines. Uh, in some areas, we lack a comprehensive list of patients with hematological malignancies, and this does not make, make our task really very easy. So uh, these are the future challenges um, that I have already expressed uh, just a little bit before the access to vaccine, the security and efficacy of vaccination. But basically, I think that security, uh, security is an issue, but probably the most important question marks are on efficacy, the probability to seroconvert after vaccination, the cellular response to vaccination. And I think that this is my last slide. Uh, which basically summarizes what I wanted to share with you. Um, something which is very clear nowadays, but maybe six months ago or nine months ago was not so clear. So the vulnerability of patients uh, with hematological malignancies to SARS-CoV-2 infection that we have been able to identify, some prognostic factors which are quite constant in the different analyses and that have already um, been presented hematological malignancies are quite are very heterogeneous. And because of what I have seen, patients with hematological malignancies have been prioritized in the vaccination programs. And we really need to learn more about it because maybe responses um, are going to be lower than in the general population of patients. And maybe and we should, be, we should uh, work in the future in select a better vaccine and the best time point for vaccination.
So thank you very much for your attention and now I'm happy to take some questions and comments. So I'm going to stop sharing the presentation. Thank you very much, Doctor, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, we already have some questions, but before I go in uh, and respond them, I would like to remind uh, people in the webinar that they have two ways to ask questions. One of them is in writing in the question and answer window, and the other one is just um, clicking the right hand button. So um, I will uh, I will uh, nude you, and you can ask the question directly to the doctor. Um, one of the questions that uh, well uh, we received, uh, in fact, uh, so many times is about that, those articles in the Lancet and Blood. Uh, I know you mentioned that in your in your presentation as well, but uh, uh, they show that uh, the the vaccine might be less effective in myeloma patients. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? And and also even if uh, the vaccine is less effective, uh, I guess the it's very important to get vaccinated anyway for patients. Yeah. So. Let's say I think that uh, I would like to make uh, some remarks on that. Um, I think it's very important to get vaccinated, no doubt about it. And I think that this is being demonstrated on how I would say that at least in the European map, all the governments have tried to prioritize as much as possible vaccination in multiple myeloma patients and in oncohematological uh, patients in general. After having said that, I think it's true and probably either, uh, although we don't have a lot of information already published in the literature, because as you have seen, these two papers that I have briefly presented are really very new. Probably, and this is also my guess, although I don't have a personal experience on that, the capacity of multiple myeloma patients in this specific case to respond to vaccines is not going to be the same than the healthy population of people. And maybe the response rate is going to differ between different subgroups of multiple myeloma patients. Um, we need to know more about it. And I, I think, and this is what we are doing, um, yeah, in Spain, so there is a proposal uh, in which many hospitals will try to participate to analyze in depth the response to vaccination, both the humoral response in terms of antibody, IgG antibody producing, and the T cell response of hematological patients to vaccines in the way that we are vaccinating now our patients. So we are following the label. So two doses for Pfizer, for Moderna, which are the, basically the vaccines that are being used, at least in Spain, and I think that in other countries, basically for patients with hematological malignancies. So we need to study that. We need to understand which is the response and which patients within a specific disease group are going to respond better or worse. And when we know that, and I think that this is going to be done in parallel because the uh, science is moving so fast in this field um, that probably all these studies are going to be moving in parallel. We will need to understand if the way that vaccines are being used nowadays is the best way for our patients. This seems to be, at least for the time being, the best way for healthy people. And these are the population of people that have been studied but we don't know about these specific populations. So, um, but independently on that, I think that the message is that everybody or all of you need to get vaccinated. Thank you, doctor. And uh, in relation with, uh, with what you just said about the vaccines and the different vaccines that we have, there are some questions about um, what is the difference between them, between all of the vaccines, and what vaccines is more recommended to patients? Uh, one of the questions says that, for example, in, in the Netherlands, they are using Moderna uh, for patients, but uh, that person asked if it's the same in all countries, and then what is the difference between all countries? Okay, so basically, basically the recommendation um, is uh, to use these messenger RNA uh, vaccines uh, uh, because 
when talking about immunosuppressed patients, we can always think that vaccination can eventually produce the disease itself. And of course, this is one thing that we don't uh, want. So in principle, I would say that Pfizer and Moderna are the ones that are being used. Uh, there are differences between them, but from a practical point of view, that does not seem the case. And I have to say that we are using Moderna in our institution too, to vaccinate all our uh, hematological patients. And um, I think that probably there are some issues related to the supplies that may change that or eventually policies. But I would say that um, probably there is no difference between Pfizer and Moderna, at least uh, that I know of. But we are still starting with the whole process. Thank you, doctor. And one of the questions that we are receiving now is, can a myeloma patient be vaccinated with Pfizer with a 42 day, days interval between uh, dose one and dose two? Well, this is one thing that has been, um, let's say, um, publicized a lot. Um, and in principle, that was not, um, I mean, that was not the time interval that was in the label, but there are some studies indicating that the uh, rate of, Im of immunity does not change. After having said that, I go back to the information that we have. And the information that we have basically relates to healthy people. So um, it's always a question mark on which will be the impact, even using 21 days uh, for patients with multiple myeloma in this case. I'm sure, sorry, Anna, I'm sure that um, uh, that many countries or all the uh, most of the European countries are conducting nowadays, and I'm sure, and I know that, uh, many studies trying to follow really very closely the um, response rate of patients to vaccination and probably and this is what always happens in science, unfortunately, that at this specific time point, we really don't know exactly 100% the truth. And if we are going to discuss the same issue, maybe in one year, some of the questions that all of us have will have completely been solved by all the investigation that is being done nowadays. Thank you, doctor. The next question. Uh, I am a myeloma patient on third light of treatment of, um, uh, with chem chemotherapy based on lenalidomide, ixazomib, and dexamethasone. Uh, how does this chemo further affect my immunity to COVID? Well, let's say uh, we have already seen that, at least in some studies, active disease and, act and active treatment, it's, let's say, a risk factor, let's put it this way, uh, this way for, develop, uh, for developing COVID-19 infection. So um, probably even within multiple myeloma patients, it's not the same thing to have the disease in remission and not being under any specific treatment that being uh, with active disease, I assume, and that's the reason why, I mean, you are in a specific uh, under um, active therapy. So that's one thing to be taken into consideration. Uh, we always have to think that the, um, let's say the infectious risk, it's not only because of the line of treatment that you are receiving right now, but eventually also because of the um, prior history of prior treatments of a long standing disease. So that's another thing that has to be taken into consideration. So at the end of the day, the uh, prior treatment history of the patient has an impact if in many aspects and probably will have also an impact in the risk of getting the infection. So I would say that in this specific situation, it's clearly indicating indicated the vaccination with all the question marks that we have discussed before. Uh, thank you, doctor. And uh, just uh, also some clarification of uh, one of, the, of your previous response. Uh, you mentioned that for patients, usually it's recommended Pfizer and Moderna. And, and some people have some questions about if you only can access to the AstraZeneca vaccines or Janssen. Um, 
you should get vaccinated anyway. So you, do you yes. have to wait until you have any other available? No. no, I think that it's as always in this life, it's a question of balancing risk and benefits, cons and pros. Um, I think that the message is that uh, vaccination will be the only way to stop COVID-19 pandemic with what it represents and um, that all the vaccines have demonstrated efficacy. So um, if Pfizer or Moderna is not available, AstraZeneca or Janssen uh, have been approved by all the regulatory agencies, FDA and EMA, and they can do the job. Thank you, doctor. And one of the questions uh, related to this topic as well. I have been vaccinated once with AstraZeneca. Can I ask for the second vaccination with Pfizer or Moderna? I'm not so sure how uh, how to an uh, how to answer this specific question. I would say um, that I would probably continue with AstraZeneca. Um, I don't have clear ideas if, let's say, switching to a different one makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I, I guess that will depend also on the guidelines of each country and, and how they decide to... Uh, absolutely. Uh, this is one thing that, uh, I mean, I have tried to mention during my presentation, and of course, because I am Spanish, I have focused my attention basically in what we are doing in Spain. Um, unfortunately, it's a moving field. So probably if you review different guidelines, the guidelines are not going to say 100% the same. Um, and probably the guidelines um, um, are going to change over time. And of course, I'm sure that there are different regulations in different countries that will make things a little bit different. Thank you, Doctor. Next question. I'm uh, 74 on chemotherapy, lenalidomide, exasomid, dexamethasone as a third line of treatment. I have had two vaccinations and have antibodies. How is my risk level? Well, you are not 100% free, but having antibodies, if they last long enough, um, let's say, I, th I, I think that you are in less risk than uh, many of other people. Um, so let's say we are being vaccinated and we are being told we still have to take care and to uh, continue with the same, let's say, distancing measures that we have been taking for the last uh, one year and a half. So, but of course, at least, for, at least for the time being, you have antibodies, which does not prevent 100% to be infected, but it prevents a lot. And that, that the same person asked, um, my vaccine was AstraZeneca, would a third vaccination help? We don't know. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Um, one of the, well, the next question, what is the efficacy on the vaccines on different strains? Uh, do the vaccines cover all of them or only some of them? So um, I think that the level of information that we have is not exactly the same with the different uh, vaccines. Uh, so it's and probably, I mean, for the vaccines that have been more new in the market, more uh, or newer in the market. So, for instance, AstraZeneca and uh, Janssen, uh, there is, uh, I mean, there is quite a lot of scientific work to try to overcome these issues. So, um, so for instance, uh, AstraZeneca seems to be less effective with the South African. Um, variant for those uh, mild and moderate, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, infect, uh, infective cases, and it it's a fic it seems to be efficacious or efficacious for the Britannic uh, variant. But they are doing quite a lot of studies. Uh, first, Pfizer seems to be effective uh, for the uh, UK and for the South African variant. And um, it seems that for Moderna, uh, although the, um, at the end, the level of antibodies does not seem to make a difference, but it's, uh, the effectiveness seems to be somewhat reduced uh, 
uh, with the uh, South African variant. But I would say that this is quite a preliminary information, depending on the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, uh, the sources that you uh, read. Uh, maybe the information is different, but um, and probably we will be having additional information, but that's basically the information I have. And of course, probably the ones that appeared first and with, and with what we have more experience probably have, let's say, a more solid data regarding specific variants. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I know we are over time. Uh, and I would like to ask you as uh, the last question and, and yep. probably the rest of the questions that we have, maybe they can send them by, by email. We have the questions here, so maybe uh, we can send them to you by email. So if you Absolutely. Have time, you I would be happy to answer all the questions that we have not been able to answer now. Uh, so the last question, uh, do you have any recommendation for smoldering myeloma patients? Even though we are not in treatment with chemo, uh, I would like to know if there is any special attention uh, when receiving the vaccination. I mean, I would say, and this is one thing that we are doing, we are, uh, we are vaccinating a patient with a smoldering myeloma. Uh, it's true that maybe, I mean, the risk of COVID-19 of COVID infection is not going to be exactly the same uh, because the disease in inverted commas, is not active. You have not received prior therapy just because of the disease. But, but the recommendations is that, uh, uh, that you and, let's say, the rest of the people in this situation get vaccinated. Thank you, doctor. And, and the last question, and uh, now for real, is uh, I am a myeloma patient and I'm doing, uh, I'm going to be treated tomorrow with daratumumab, Previgen and dexamethasone and I start a cure of 21 uh, day with lenalidomide. I had my first dose on Pfizer on uh, 26 um, uh, on April. What should I ask? So, to, so to get, I mean, if the first dose is already in, then you have this. Uh, you have to have. Uh, I mean, you have to get the second dose. Um, uh, in patients with active treatment, let's say mm, the recommendation, but let's say the level of evidence is what we have right now, is to try to vaccinate uh, in the week before. Let's say in this case because lenalidomide. Uh, it's lenalidomide. Dara and lenalidomide, or uh, Dara and dexamethasone. Dara and lenalidomide and. Yeah, I think Lara and uh, Lenalidomide. Okay, so uh, Lenalidomide will be most of it continuous, but uh, with Daratumumab, so probably I would give, uh, let's say, the second shot uh, one week or between the last week before receiving the next dose of Dara. Well, thank you very much, doctor. And uh, well, thank you for responding all the questions. If uh, we keep uh, receiving uh, questions, I will send them uh, by email to you so you can answer them. Um, just remind uh, everybody in this in this webinar that this webinar uh, has been recorded and will be uploaded to the Myeloma Patients Europe website, uh, which is www.mpeurope.org, and it will be available also in our YouTube channel. So thank you very much for your time, doctor, and uh, thank you all for, for joining us today, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Anna. Thank you.